What is going on, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer and Mike Goolsby. We're here for the Mike Goolsby Show. And my friend, you're not in your normal uh, setup. Where are you at? I'm coming to you live from the Niobrara Lounge. Lodge, excuse me, in Valentine, Nebraska. I'm out here for work. Okay. So, yeah, it's about roughly five hours away from Omaha. So, it's a bit of a trip. So, we got Goolsby on the road. And uh, we have a pretty fun show. Mike, I think this was like an A-list priority guest for you to get on the show. I mean, they really really all have. Um, but uh, Greg yeah. Madison um, joins us a bit later in the show. Um, you guys will get to uh, – that interview is fantastic. We recorded it Friday morning. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that's going to be awesome. So make sure you stick stick around for that. Madison recruited Goolsby to Notre Dame, so there's a lot of good discussion there. Folks, uh, if you're listening via podcast, please uh, leave us a kind review wherever you listen to your uh, podcast. And if you're watching uh, on YouTube live or on the replay, please do hit that thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel here, Blue and Gold, for more content. Do have uh, a few different topics to get to before on the Coach Madison interview. Um, just kind of sporadic topics. Um, one being, I think this might, we're not going to talk a ton about Carter Nelson specifically, this tight end from Ainsworth, which I believe huh. is not too far from where you're from. Yeah. yeah. Committing to Nebraska. But I want to say there's the theme here that of thing you wanted to talk about was maybe a little bit of, um, just, you know, proximity to home recruiting in general. Um, I don't follow Mike. What do you mean? Proximity to home? Or, I'm sorry. Like. Mean? Carter Nelson, I, when we were talking on the phone today, you mentioned like, hey, this this kid's staying close to home. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, well, that's, this, that's, that's I remember an, being interesting. With this kid in particular, he, he's in Ainsworth, Nebraska, and I think it's been covered pretty significantly. Like it's in the – ostensibly, Mike, it's in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So where I'm at, Valentine, Nebraska, it's like 45 minutes, drove right past Ainsworth. Mike, have you ever seen the movie – say anything with john cusack you might be a little young for that so yes. it's a hard no well there's a scene in the movie it's kind of famous you know john cusack whatever his love interest was during the film he's like standing outside of her window holding up a boom box playing uh in your eyes peter gabriel song if you know the song so i was like gosh i should like go to carter's house and just you know play the fight song out there with a, a boom box or something tonight but no, it's a hard, it's a, that kid in particular, we just grew up hardcore Nebraska fan. I think he's an NFL kid. I mean, he is like uniquely talented, um, plays eight man football, but just in terms of like genetically his, like his athletic profile, seven foot high jumper. I was really, really hoping that, um, and I know we give him a run for his money. And I talked to coach Parker about him on the phone a couple different times, just maybe trying to find an angle. But he's going to be a good one. So I think um, – and presumably a great kid. But that's just – what you were talking about, whether it's Carter Nelson or a kid from the south, Isaiah Canyon. Yeah. We decommits because there's a family member that doesn't want to fly to go watch his games. And it's like, what does that have to do with the kid? You know, if, if with Carter Nelson, if your parents grew up hardcore Husker fans <sighs> – does that mean that you automatically get lumped into that and that you, you know, you, you can't maybe like be a little bit more of a free thinker. Um, it's difficult for his family to travel to a South Bend or an Isaiah Canyon for his family to travel to South Bend. It's like, well, it's Isaiah Canyon's career. It's his life. And you have some of these external influences that kind of factor into that decision. And so it's just, sometimes I think it sucks for the kid. If, if Notre Dame's where he wanted to go and grandma and grandpa won't get on a plane to come. It's like, is that his problem? You know, as a recruit? And I I stayed close to home. Um, You're a battleship, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> I was a battleship. Yeah, should have left the harbor of the Midwest. So it's just interesting when you kind of sit back, Mike, and you talk to these young kids often, all of the factors and all the pressures that they face, some to me are a little bit nonsensical. It's like, Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was talking to my wife um, the other day, and I asked her, I was like, in this generation of 
you know, high school kids right now, or even, you know, young twenties, is there something about staying close to home that these kids just don't want to go out? And we didn't really come to much of a conclusion, but do you get that sense at all, Mike? Is there something about, okay, of course it's not a blanket statement. I mean, kids go all, all over the country all the time for recruiting, but do you feel like there's more of a sense of kids like I, Elijah rushing the five-star from Arizona commits to Arizona mm-hmm. Canyon, Georgia tech, uh, Nelson, Nebraska. Of course, these are just three small examples, uh, but there just seems Mike to be more. Uh, and I don't have much data here, um, but kids wanting to just stay close, like proximity to home seems like a more bigger deal than ever in my decade of covering recruiting. I wonder, so you're saying it's more prevalent now than it was 10 years ago? Okay, maybe, yes, may, maybe hmm. 10 years, but I think maybe 20 years ago, I think it's, there it might be a little ebb and a flow. Like a Mike Goolsby in the late 90s stays close to home, but then maybe 15 years later, that's the cool things to leave home. And now it's kind of coming back again. This is kind of just my, my I'm spitballing here. No, you might have more to add to it than me, but my immediate, my first response to that question is why are kids choosing to play close to home? They're being recruited harder. You know, I tell the high level kids that I train, I'm like, man, and I try to really stay out of the recruiting Like we've said before, like if I can open a door for a kid, I'll do so. But beyond that, it's your decision. I mean, I truly am hands off. But I do tell them, I'm like, bro, this is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for you to go live in California, for you to go move to the SEC country or move to the East Coast, whatever. You can always come back home as an adult once you graduate if the NFL doesn't work out. But this is your one like chance to like go branch out and make your own decision. I would argue, though, Mike, and it's probably just a matter of fact, but like Eliza Russian going to Arizona, he's being recruited harder by that Arizona staff. Whereas like a school like a Notre Dame, they feel like they've, they've got like a lesser odds just because of the distance. And inevitably, they won't recruit a kid like that as hard as a school in the backyard. Does that and make there's, sense? there's local pressure, too. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, like, if you talk to a college coach, let's just say a Notre Dame coach, and they were going to offer this kid from California, and it happens a lot in Nebraska. It's a better example. So a California, maybe a West Coast, use Arizona, for example. University of Arizona will be hesitant, recruit, slash offer a Nebraska kid because they think that there's a 80% chance that kid's going to sign with Nebraska anyway. So it's like, is it, a, is it a waste of time for an Arizona to recruit a Nebraska kid to spend the time, money, energy to go pursue that kid when they figure maybe he's odds are he's going to pick the Huskers anyway? Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think that's part of the reason why, like, yes, schools don't even go into Nebraska to offer or like a yeah. Wisconsin? Um, I think it's absolutely, and I've been told as much by college coaches. That's why they. Because, again, the, a kid like a Carter Nelson grows up, you know, he's as a diehard Husker fan, just part of the culture. But that's not what I'm saying. It's not exclusive to just Nebraska kids. Right. You know, Arizona feels like, man, we got a way better shot of getting Elijah Rushing because he's here and they're going to yeah. recruit the shit out of him. And they, you know, in terms of like the energy and the effort and the, the number of calls, the connectivity, it's difficult for a Notre Dame to compete with somebody when they're in your backyard. And – to counter that point, though, Notre Dame, I've written this so many times. Mm-hmm. There's something about Notre Dame, though, that they can go into Athens and pull out Deion Colsey or go into Columbus and pull out Lorenzo Styles, or go into you know Malvern, PA, and get Peter Jones with a family full of Penn State grads and fans. You know, like there's you know just a few examples off the top of my head. Like there is something about Notre Dame, though, that they are able to kind of do that unthinkable. Um, it's a national brand. It just is the South. So this is great. The Ohio's, the Pennsylvania's, that's great. It's fine and well. I mean, but the South, for whatever reason, you know, they've got different athletes, especially on the O-line, D-line, just bigger, faster, stronger athletes. That's the real challenge. And I mean, you, you're in Atlanta. There's the South, Mike, you tell me there's the South and then there's kind of the deeper South, Right. So that's, I mean, if, if we're on the fringes plucking a kid or two from the, the quote-unquote South, how do you get into 
the Alabamas. I mean, Coach Madison talked about that when he was recruiting Justin Tuck from Kellyton, Alabama, a town of whatever he said, 1,500 people. Yeah. So that's rare. Yeah. Yeah, the deep south, and you're talking about Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. Yeah. Different that's type different. of athlete, though. That's just, just a different type of athlete. And, again, we've talked about this ad nauseum. It's kids that love football. A lot of times kids that need the game. Um, and I think that 40 for 40 message – Four, 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 yeah. maybe a little stale, a little bit lost on those guys. And that's that, that's the whole reason that we had Coach Madison on. Selfishly, I'm just trying to go through my little Rolodex and get some of my buddies on and guys that I love and get them on the get them on the pod. But I wanted to talk to Coach Madison about this is all on the off the heels of the Justin Scott. Right. You know, us losing Justin Scott. I wanted to get his two cents. Yeah, Goolsby asks Greg Madison again, who coach from who coach at Notre Dame from 97 to 04, I believe. Mm-hmm. Does Notre Dame need five stars? Point blank goes we asked him, and you guys will get to hear Madison's answer. Um, fairly interesting. So, yeah, make sure you guys uh, tune into the entire show. Um, yeah, good discussion, Goolsby. We talk about the South, then there's Florida. Like, you know, like Deep South, South, right? I mean, it's not necessarily ge- geography. Sure. You know, because like Florida is obviously the most southern, but Florida is just its own world down there. As far as football is concerned, yeah, it's it kind amazing. of amazing. Yeah. But just in terms of, you know, headline Florida man, even that as well. It's just, it's just different. Florida's, uh, it's something else. Um, but what is that? But what is that though, Michael? Like it's different. Can you quantify okay. it? So, I mean, I live, I'd say probably half my life in Florida. Like you're Miami, just, you know, Broward. You know, Dade Dade County, Fort Lauderdale. yeah, Dade County, just all of that. Just let's just call Miami. That is a totally different world than like Tampa. Tampa is, you know, not a totally different world than Orlando, but still like Disney, it is. And then Jacksonville, the armpit of the state, that's a different world there. And then you go to the panhandle, and it's so it's like several states and kind of culture mixed into one. Um, but if you're yeah. talking about football specific, In, that Miami Dade County area, why? So why is there so populated much populated with athletes, man? And the in the in the culture, the level of competitiveness, etc. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Right. This is a fun thing. So I talked about we've had Preston Jackson, right? Yeah. Big county preps. First guest. First guest, yeah. And I talked to him about that corner that I worked with that went out to Oregon and he Avante Dickerson, and he grew up a hardcore gator fan. Mm-hmm. And I was like, who do you know over at Florida that I could call? Because this kid's got an LSU offer. He's got an Ohio State offer. Preston watched his film. And he's a top 10 corner, top 100 player a few years ago coming out. Preston's like, oh, he's a dime a dozen down here. <laughs> I was like, okay. He's like, he's a dime a dozen. He's like, that's why Florida won't recruit him. Because like they could walk out their back door and they got kids like with that type of athleticism, that type of speed, et cetera. I was like, damn, okay. And he would know. Preston yeah. would know. So that's the ultimate challenge is it's been talked about on the message board is. And I think we, you asked me last time we're on the show is what's the pitch to a five star. Yeah. What's the pitch. And it's like, yeah, we want to touch on the four for 40, but it's like, whoever the player is, you're going to the league. It's kind of a foregone for conclusion, sell them on that idea. And then coming out of the league, once you're a multimillionaire and you, you played for a decade, you want to tap into the, all the resources that a Notre Dame education in the network can provide. Yeah. Whereas maybe a, a university of Florida might not, that'd be my pitch, but it's okay. In my, for, through my lens, Mike, it's okay for Notre Dame and coach Freeman to talk to these high level kids about the NFL. Like it's okay to lead with that. It's, yeah. There's nothing, you know, nothing wrong with that. One other note before we move on to another topic, you know, going back to, you know, like the, the Florida Gators and yet why, why recruit Nebraska and you have this entire backyard for you. I mean, we call Chicago Notre Dame's backyard, you know, it's an hour and a half away and, and that's like the biggest talent base close to them. Like it's just, mm-hmm. it's tough. It's tough. And, and I, I mean, people will comment on our YouTube, like Mike, you don't like Indiana football enough. Like it's, it's good, but I mean, and I get, you know, high school football dad that, you know, your, your son played in, in, in state of Indiana and, 
you know, there's some good teams, but dude, Florida, Texas, California, it's just different, man. Yeah. Um, so well, it's just, it, like it's a lot of those advantage for Notre Dame. Those warm weather places, Mike, I mean, they're doing football year. I mean, they take football classes in high school where they're learning scheme or whatever. Yeah. Um, you, know, you don't have that in Indiana and Illinois and yeah. the surrounding communities around sure. Notre Dame's campus. You just don't. It is absolutely different. It's quantifiable. Yeah. All right, Mike. Uh, on three came out with updated 2024 uh, yeah. rankings on Monday. Yeah. And CJ Carr's national ranking remained unchanged. It's a number 193 overall player and number 14 quarterback in the country. So, Mike, just what's your take on uh, CJ Carr's ranking? Is this a big deal? Is this something people need to, you know, to be upset about? Or is it justified? Like, what do you think? Mike, who cuts your checks? Who cuts your checks? On three. Okay. Who cuts your checks? <laughs> I don't even know, dude. The Wizard of Oz? I don't even know. Um, so we said a couple episodes prior, you said, Mike, say it again for the people in back about these rankings. Like, say it again. We're like, yeah, who gives a shit, right? And in yeah. the grand scheme of things, who cares? Um, and uh, we did talk about, you know, the godfather of recruiting, Tom Lemming, who was gracious enough to put me on his All-American team. Um, he told me flat out, and this is 20 years ago before recruiting and recruiting services and all the media coverage had really blown up. But he's like, if you want to be an all American, whether that's a Reebok all American at the time or, you know, USA today, all American, he's like, wait to commit because people will stop reading about you and they become less in vogue. And that's a very real thing. And he told me 20 years ago, he told me that 20 years ago and I, I believe him. And I was a, you know, unanimous all American. So there is some validity to CJ Carr committed almost a year ago, right? So he's not sexy as far as the media piece. And then on three is like the the new, the newest recruiting kind of service out there. You, like Rivals is long standing, right? ESPN is kind of long standing in terms of these outfits that make these ratings. So is it beneficial for an on three to like drop his ratings to get a few more clicks and kind of stir the pot? Sure. It's, I mean, well, then why is it? You know, you are my Twitter mentions today. <laughs> oh, is that well, right? Well, yeah, people are, oh, it's, it's, it's for clicks. Well, I'm they are running a business. Guys, what, what clicks do we get? If anything, I have people saying, oh, I'm never eating blue and golden get. I'm canceling blue and gold. I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs like, I don't got any damn thing to do with this. But yeah, sure. Her, her, her old singer in blue and gold, but yeah, um, it, yeah, I, 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 it doesn't do anything. If, if anything, it's good when the Notre Dame quarterback ranked higher. We get a lot of clicks. You know, sure. it's great. It's sure, good. this is great. Uh, and the other thing about on three being the new kid on the block, sure, but like, you know, the everyone at on three worked either at Rivals or 247. You know, like mm -hmm. <laughs> the guy who started on three worked, started both of those. Charles Power, who, you know, everyone hates his guts in my in my Twitter mentions on the message board. Um, he was the scouting guy after, I think, don't hold me to this. I, Barton Simmons left 24-7 for, for Vanderbilt to work for Clark Lee. And I think Charles Power worked in Simmons' role. Or, yeah, um, or, or replaced him. So it's like power ran scouting at twenty four seven. So it's not like you know, it's just kind of popped out of the woodwork. But uh, I mean, the only other thing like, to add is this: this new ranking by on three is coming off uh, the elite eleven, right? Mm -hmm. So that wrapped up a few weeks ago. So is there new intel from that elite eleven camp? that affects that rating. Maybe his arm strength, his arm isn't that strong. Maybe isn't that great on the whiteboard in terms of processing things. Who knows? I mean, that's the only other thing. I mean, you'd have to find somebody from that elite 11, you know, camp to yeah. interview to get that, to get that perspective. Um, but I just think in general, it's just like, it's kind of old news. It's kind of, he's kind of become stale as a recruit and Cam Williams is no different. I mean, Cam Williams is an exceptional player that doesn't get talked about. And we've said it before, man, like conflict is great for content. So it's like, you know, us losing, losing Justin Scott to Ohio State. It's like people want to talk about that more than how great of a player Cam Williams is going to be. Yeah. And when you talk about building a class and winning football games, 
And we'll see it like when we tee it up against like Ohio State. Like you only need a handful of special players kind of interspersed on whether it's your offense or your defense to win these games. And you've got a couple in Cam Williams and CJ Carr. You know, you're going to develop a gro- some group. You're going to have some solid guys. You're going to have de- developmental guys, which I was trying to say. But he's a great player, man. And yeah. to anybody that's um, freaking out about these ratings, just go back and watch his film. You know, make a nice glass of tea or something and just relax. He's a yeah. great player. He's a great yeah. player. Relax. Take, a, take some Roach Shop product. I don't know. Kind of calm down. Gotta, we, can do be, a, yeah. we have to have more things to do than to yell at Mike Singer on Twitter. You would think. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> People, someone was like, Mike, why don't, when are you going to stand up for CJ? I'm kind of like, when are you when are you gonna when are you gonna sound off? People want me to sound off, so when I don't, it's uh no, it's, and it's it's really interesting too, Mike, because like I don't really follow recruiting. Like I, I to me, I I don't even have children of my own, but like I've got too much stuff going on to pay attention to like the class of twenty twenty five, and like maybe I'm doing our viewers a disservice by that, but it's like, let me know when they sign or at least let me know when they commit and we'll, we'll talk about it. But I, you drive yourself nuts following the whims of like a 16 year old kid and their subsequent rankings. Hey, hey, it's hey, like, hey, yeah. take it easier. You're, you're trying to put me out of a job. <laughs> no, no, but I'm just saying, uh, well, you know, if that's, if that's what you're going to do for a living, you're going to have to catch some, take some heat at some point too. Oh, right, man? Oh, I, mean, oh I, I, I know. And I can't even, I mean, personally, I can't even keep up. It's like, oh, 2023, 2024, 2025. It's just like, man, it's just constantly yeah. going. And that's where we're at now, bro. It's just like, when when does the season start? Yeah, you're talking about the conflict creates interest, right? That's 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 one of the ghouls. It creates content, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's the last thing you text me, dude, we need the season. Because <laughs> yeah. you need content. Like, we need content. So, yeah, I'm with you. But, um yeah, soul CJ car ranking. I'll, I'll add one more thing, and I'm sure uh, uh, Hyde and I will talk more about this tomorrow night because, again, we need someone to talk about, and the people love talking about CJ Carr and his ranking. Is keep this same energy hating rankings when yeah Notre Dame takes a three star. Just keep that same energy because yeah. right now it's on three. But tomorrow it'll be twenty four seven. The next day it'll be rivals. Then it'll be ESPN. Like they all, the, it all is cyclical, right? Sure. On three just doesn't give a shit about the other websites and their rankings at all. So they don't care. Like oh, twenty four seven and rivals have them as a top forty player. Then maybe we should have them higher ranked too. Like on three don't give a shit, man. And I respect them for it. Do I disagree? CJ Carr's ranking? Hell yeah, I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. I tell Charles Power that every time I see him, I see Charles multiple times a year. Uh, and I think it's ridiculous. Um, it just, yeah, we have to get but, their criteria it, broken down on what they're I, looking I'm, for at the position. Go ahead, sorry. I'm, I'm just not, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna go on Twitter and and bash me. Like it's it's. I mean, we just have to have better things to do with our lives than try to put other people down. And then I was thinking, well, man, <laughs> we have rankings for high schoolers. <laughs> like that's also weird, right? But then I was thinking. Dude, we have high school games on ESPN, oh, yeah. right? These kids get NIL deals in high school. They are huge brands in high school. It sets them up for criticism in college. I, I say that to recruit parents all the time when they when we kind of talk about interviews. I'm like, listen, I think these interviews, you're, when the, your son is at the podium, when he, you know, after a, a loss in college, he's our, he knows how to handle himself in an interview. He's been doing it since he was 15 years old. So it's, that's kind of the side. It's, it's, a, it's a multi-layered thing. I mean, I can again. When I was being recruited, it wasn't recruiting wasn't as big of a thing. It just wasn't. There wasn't, wasn't even an industry. Game. Yeah, the, it wasn't an industry. It's an industry that really created itself. It's kind of cool in hindsight to look back at it, but you know, there was like a max. Max Preps is still around. I don't know what it is outside of just a website, but like. That guy, whoever it was from like, and I'm going to say it was Max Prep. Somebody called me and they wanted me to like fill out like every week. They wanted me to like fill out. This is old school, right? 1998, whatever. Fill out some form of like, who are my top schools and all this stuff. It was like in the mail. And after a while, I was like, F this. Like, this is so stupid. 
And I would stop taking the guy's phone calls because this was like a weekly thing. And then they, they ranked me like the eighth best player in the state of Illinois. And that was just kind of like a middle finger back to me. I was like, this whole thing is like a game. So, like, I don't know how much CJ Carr plays that game. Real quick, since we need some content. Top five, let me guess first. Top five singer ND signees. Mm. You with me? Mm. Okay. In no particular order, but we all know Angeli's number one. Joe Walt's number two. Deion Colsey's number three. Uh, we'll, we'll throw Vernon in there at four. I don't know who the fifth would, would be. Am I f- fairly accurate? Well, I mean, you give me a top – tell me top five and you only give me four. I can't come up with a fifth. Car's I know all Angeli. Carr's in there for sure. One of my favorites. Um, yeah, Angeli, Alt, Vernon, Carr – Pine? Oh, interesting. Pine's, I mean, just great kids to interact with, man. Just fantastic. You want to know my other – another one? Didn't end up at Notre Dame, but C.J. Williams, the USC – you know, he flipped from Notre Dame to USC and then uh, ended up transferring to Wisconsin after a year. Great kid. Great kid. One of my favorites. How do you – are you able – because I think – I can think of C.J. Williams in my brain – Jalen Speed's up there too. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Okay. So, but they're Jalen Sneed and CJ Williams are CJ Williams is like incredibly polished in terms of again, we're talking about playing the game almost to the point where he seems like fraudulent to me. You know, so when you saw about like him transferring at leaving SC, it's like that didn't surprise me at all. Okay. You know, I think he's gotten almost players like that. Mike, is that a thing where they're so good at the at the interview? And winding, you know, recruiting analysts up. Does that affect? Is is he more highly rated because of that versus oh. a Brennan Vernon who doesn't pick up the phone and talk to anybody? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about the rankings. Mm. Okay, I don't. I I've, I've never done the rankings, so I don't know. I would hope. But as much as you love Angeli, for example, you would have a difficult time. Oh, oh yes. Lowering his ranking. Oh, I, it would. Yeah, you know, be in, extremely difficult, which is why analysts. The people doing the rankings should not be reporters. Got it. Charles Power doesn't talk to recruits. You know, like he doesn't, doesn't, yeah. doesn't do that. He's never talked to any of these kids before. And well, based off your conversations know. with Mr. Powers, what are his top three criteria when it comes to evaluating quarterback play and the rankings that follow? You Can't know, I've asked. Can't well, say I've asked. Well, because I look at CJ Carr, he's playing ball in Michigan. He's not 6'4. Doesn't necessarily have a cannon arm. He can do all the Mahomes type stuff, moving around the pocket like a Kenny Minchie type. Super accurate. I mean, I when when he's when you look at a a CJ Carr, I'm like all those other ratings, like to be a top five, top ten quarterback. That's where he should be. You know, he's not going to be a number one five star just because he doesn't have any of those. Right. Like, so we had a go ahead comment here. If you don't like Carr's ranking, who are you going to drop him in front of? I don't know. I think like most people, we we don't know. I don't. Goolsby, can you even name ten other quarterbacks in this class? Like I, I just I, told you, I don't follow her. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I feel like most people can't. So we get so upset about a ranking, like we don't even know who the other players are. Maybe a little bit more at quarterback, right? There's so much more in the headlines for you know most folks follow recruiting, but still, like it's you know. It's just so if we if we talk about like Anthony Richardson, right? The quarterback from Florida, third pick overall this year to the Colts, you know, plays 13 games, tons of untapped potential. But you you just he does so many wow things, whether it's doing backflips at the combine, throwing the ball 75 yards, running, ran four four three, and he actually swerved out. He should have been a four three nine guy. But like if that guy gets a five star rating, you're like, oh yeah, because he has all those wow plays. And that's to me what grabs again in our yeah, we have the attention span of two year olds nowadays. That's what grabs people's attention. Yeah. A calm, athletic enough quarterback, super accurate player in CJ Carr, it doesn't grab people the same way that some of these other higher profile I mean, hell, even Deuce Knight, our boy Deuce Knight, right? Look at you knowing his name's Deuce Knight. Right? You know, people are going to fall in love with him because he's got a cool name. You know what I'm saying? Stuff like that matters to people, it's you know, pretty, pretty in terms cool. of popularity. Yeah, he, he had multiple elites recruits from Chicago. People don't really talk about Notre Dame not getting Marquis Lightfoot in this 2024 class. I'm going to talk about Justin Scott 
I get it for whatever reason, Lightfoot didn't get that same pub as Justin Scott. Hmm. Um, well, he but well, Justin Scott's been playing the game. He likes the recruiting process. It's pretty evident. Yeah, I he mean, likes it. They committed around, I think, within the same week. But Scott just definitely drew, drew the attention, high ranking early on, I guess. But um, all right, Mike, we're we're half hour in. Did, was there any of those topics you sent me in your notes that you wanted to get to before we get to Greg Madison? Is the Under Armour deal finalized, Mike? No. Or is it just reading the tea leaves that we're going to end up with Under Armour again? Most likely. If that's the case, Under Armour needs to do something where, you know, Jordan brand is its own standalone brand, but it's affiliated with Nike, where Under Armour has to do more for Notre Dame. Because, I mean, we are the bell of the ball in terms of who's in their, I guess, college athletic portfolio, where it's like we come out with a cool cleat or something like that. And I always go back to like USC. I don't know if they're famous for it, Mike, but like USC wears a black cleat with white laces. It's very much, it's like USC's thing. Like can no, can Under Armour create something for a Notre Dame? If we're going to get stuck with Under Armour again, I would really push them to develop something proprietary, something cool for us to kind of hang our hat on. That's just a, a random thought. Cause it's disappointing to hear that you're going to get stuck with Under Armour again. Um, but no, that's about it. And then the only other thing, just I can't wait to t- actually talk football. And it's like, you know, this it's all the usual suspects, the young receiver class, obviously Sam Hartman, you know, the defensive line gets a little bit of publicity, but there's a, a handful of guys that I don't think at any, um, what does this say? Sorry, I just, I, I forgot to pop this up. What about the minds of six years? You just can't get worked up about it. Yeah. Yeah, and I again, I was that sixteen-year-old. Um, yeah, it's just these are young men. So yeah, don't don't let it ruin your week. But uh, yeah, there's a there's a number of players. I just made a quick note that I don't think it literally any publicity. I need to be talked about. Number one is this Antonio Carter, the tri- transfer. Or is he at Maine or Rhode Island? Rhode Island, yeah. That kid's sick, and they they keep listing him as a safety. He's listed as a safety on the roster. Wouldn't surprise me. He moves like a corner. I always talk about Michael. Guys that move the right way. He's one of those guys. Um, Along the same lines, Jade Mickey. I don't know who's really going to be our slot corner, but to me it's asinine. If a kid that's wired like Jade Mickey isn't your slot corner. Um, I have really high hopes for him, and I don't, don't think he gets talked about enough. Holden stays, doesn't get talked about at all. And he's one of two like truly healthy tight ends we have right now. Who's a great athlete and looks the part, Mike. You've seen him in person. Um, people should be talking about him. And that's that's really it. That's you know again we're kind of grasping at straws here, folks. This at this point in the off season, things right. to talk about. But yeah, BC appreciate the five. Um, Absolutely. So, so Goolsby, before we play the Greg Madison interview, like, do you want to talk about? Like, give me an intro to Greg Madison, like who he is, what he meant to your getting to Notre Dame and then your career at Notre Dame. Yeah, that's a nice – that's nice, Mike. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. Yeah, so Coach Madison, the story goes, my recruitment started off, Mike. I went to Penn State's camp before my sophomore year because I was getting moved up to varsity. They are going to play me at linebacker. I just played freshman year of football. I'd never played football before with defensive end. Anyways, that's what kicked off my recruiting because I ran really well at their camp. Got a few offers or something like local kind of Big Ten type offers over the course of my junior season. And again, this is 20 years ago. Recruiting wasn't as sped up. Back then, you could commit as a senior. You know, <laughs> that's like blows your mind. You know, there was only one signing day. So Coach Madison was recruiting a player that went to Bishop McNamara, who was like an in-conference. His name was Tim Olmstead. He ended up playing linebacker Purdue. Awful player. But he goes to watch him, and then he sees me playing Bishop Mack, and then that's how they started recruiting me. And my, my high school coach, Dan Sharp, you know, fell in love with Coach Madison, and he was just an exceptional recruiter. And uh, I touched on this during my interview for him, like what made him a special coach, what made him a special – recruiter was like I personally never wanted to disappoint the guy when I committed on my official visit he kind of like pulled me aside he's like you don't he's like you're not gonna go 
visit any of those other schools, are you? I was like, no, of course not, coach, you know, because I didn't want to upset the guy. I don't think my parents wanted to upset him. So just had a lot of confidence, kind of has a twinkle in his eye. Um, and for whatever reason, guys that played for him and guys that were recruited by him believed, believed him, you know, and he has that, like a, an authenticity about him. So, and I'll, the, I have several Coach Madison memories. I mean, probably dozens, but I remember my first game. I'm 17 years old. I think we're playing Texas A&M at home, and I'm on special teams. And it's like, uh, of all the things that guy's got going on on game day, like he pulled me to the side. He's like, I don't want to see you shit down your leg out there. He's like, you're not going to be out there shitting down your leg, are you? <laughs> I was like, well, of course not, Coach. You know, But he sought me out because he recruited me you know, and just check me before I ran down on a kickoff team or whatever. So it was a blast to get coach on. And actually when I was back in the, in South Bend for last, the spring game when coach Freeman invited former players back, he met a former teammate of my Bud and Sack, who Bud and Sack was a defensive line for coach. He met us out and had beers with us for like two hours. Cause he lives in South Bend, which was like just a really cool experience to be like 40 years old. And then you go through that transition with these coaches of yours where it's like, you know, you respect the hell out of them. And then not that you become peers, but you become friends. Like that's a beautiful part of, you know, football um, and that dynamic. So I didn't really press coach Madison out of respect, but we were talking about recruiting and I thought who, who better to bring on than coach. Yeah. So I thought, I thought it was a fun interview. Yeah. Good stuff. And that poor Purdue player just caught a stray bullet. I wonder if he's watching. He just like, <laughs> did not expect to get his name brought up like it did. Oh, he was. But I'll tell you, I could dig up the film. He was not a very good. I mean, he he was. You know, he was big. He looked the part, I guess, on paper. But yeah, he was a terrible linebacker. I don't know if you ever saw the field at Purdue, but okay. All right, a uh, couple ad reads to get to folks. Um, and and Goolsby, it's good having you on today's show. I'm We're signing get off. This. Yeah, we're gonna sign we're gonna sign Mike Goolsby off. Um, but yeah, don't go anywhere, folks, because we're gonna get to his uh interview um with former Notre Dame coach, uh assistant coach Greg Madison. Um, uh, but before we do that, a couple of uh ad reads. Um, we're gonna hear from our friends over at, of course, Augie's locker room. If you're that passionate Notre Dame fan and you're looking for a special fighting Irish piece to complete your rec room, head over to Augie'slockerroom.com. They have a wide selection of Notre Dame Stadium pieces, jerseys, helmets, autographs, and one-of-a-kind Rockney items. You can find exclusive Joe Montana signed items and famous sculptor Jerry McKenna's miniature replicas of the bronze statues around the stadium. If Augie doesn't have it in store, he will go out and find it for you. Visit AugieslockerRoom.com or stop in if you're in town, 1811 South Bend Avenue, and see the vintage helmet display dating back to 1890. AugieslockerRoom.com. Give him a call at 574 574- 277-ND-ND. And our other sponsor tonight, folks, is My Perfect Franchise. If you are a displaced corporate executive or if you're wanting to put your career in your own hands, maybe you're an experienced entrepreneur wanting to diversify, well, Andy Ludicky can help you out. He's a huge college sports fan and a franchise veteran. Andy has owned multiple franchises and businesses. Using Andy's expertise, he will help find others, find their American dream through a very thorough consultation and evaluation process. Call Andy, put your life and career in your hands. And best of all, his services are 100% free to you. So what do you have to lose? Find your perfect franchise at myperfectfranchise.net. All right, folks, here's the interview with former Notre Dame linebacker and captain Mike Goolsby and the coach that recruited him to South Bend, Greg Madison. Coach, have you ever done a podcast before? Yes. Yeah, I've done it. Let's see if Singer can figure out how to play this. All right. Let's give this a shot. Coach, have you ever done a podcast before? Yes. Yeah, I've done it before. Okay. I was hoping I'd be your first, but (laughs) it's good to have you on. So a couple weeks ago on my podcast, your recruiting comes up. I sent you that video link to that five-star defensive tackle out of Chicago, Justin Scott. You know, Notre Dame, quote unquote, like lost him. He's committed to the Buckeyes. Somebody asked the question, is Marcus Freeman's current staff, are they like the staff to, quote unquote, like get it done on the recruiting trail? 
in my mind, just jumped to Coach Madison kind of like as an elite recruiter and more importantly, coach, like a, a closer. Um, is that important for like any given staff, whether it be your, you know, your time at Michigan, your time at ND, A&M, Ohio State? Do you need a closer on a staff when it comes to recruiting nowadays? Well, first of all, on the first thing you said, Mike, uh, Marcus Freeman and his staff, in my opinion, is a great, great hire. Uh, I've known Marcus um, as a, a guy recruiting against him, a guy coaching against him. Uh, I know, obviously, some of the guys on the Notre Dame staff, and I just think that was a great hire. And everything I've seen him do and everything as I've watched the papers and everything like that, um, I just say, this guy, everything he's doing is right. And uh, it's going to take time. You know, you just don't walk in and, and all of a sudden you get every player, you know. And uh, the thing that happens in recruiting is, um, I mean, yeah, you got to have a closer. But more importantly, somebody has to hit the first time they meet. And then you build from there. And I like I remember going into to homes. I remember going into your home, for example. You leave as a recruiter and you say, I think we have a good chance with this guy. He's my kind of guy. And he is looking for what we have to offer. And if you look at it that way, then you're going to be realistic with everything and you're not going to be spinning your wheels. And, um, you know, you, you can't hit on every kid. Hmm. And, you know, there's going to be some young men that when you come in, they're going to say, no, I don't relate with this guy. This guy might, you know, you know, and then others, this guy relates like crazy, but the parents might not. Okay. Or the coach might not. So there's all those things that when you're recruiting someone. So this is, I'm, I'm hoping, like fingers crossed, that this gives us all kind of a glimpse behind the, the curtain of recruiting. So like, let's just take my recruitment, for example. And that's how you came up, because I think it was a Miami coach was walking out the front door and here comes Coach Madison walking up the front steps. And that's why I was like, I don't know if Freeman has a guy like that on his current staff that has the stones to really, you know, literally almost bump heads with a competing recruiter on, on staff. So hypothetically, you leave a, a meeting or a visit with a, with a recruit at a school, you guys don't necessarily click. Do you go back to the staff and then try another coach that might have a better vibe? No, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that works. I, I don't, I, I think, the, one of the biggest things I've always believed in in recruiting is you have to be yourself. Okay. If you're a salesman, if you are a salesman going into a home in football on the guys that you want and the guys that you need to win championships with, you will not win. You will not be successful because if you're a salesman and that kid buys, then he isn't what you really want on third and one, you know, hmm. you want the guy that you hit with right away. You, he's got the character. You see the mom or the mom and dad, or, you know, uh, like I always remember, I remember recruiting Justin Tuck in the middle of Alabama. I go to his home. I'm sitting in a home visit. Now it's Auburn and Alabama all the way on him. I go into his home and and five minutes later, his grandma and grandpa are in the home. They lived right next door. Five minutes later from then, his sisters were in the home. And I'm sitting in this home in the middle of the country talking to, to Justin Tuck. And there's like eight people sitting around the room. And I'm going, I'm saying to myself, I got a chance at this kid. This kid is looking for Notre Dame at that time. He, he was a great football player, a great basketball player. And, uh, you know, I, I can I can remember the next day staying there and going to the high school and him wanting me to introduce me to his teachers. And every teacher said, I don't care 
it, like one teacher would say, I don't care if he goes to Notre Dame, but don't let him go to Alabama. The next teacher said, I don't care if he goes to Notre Dame, but don't let him go to Auburn. Hmm. So I'm going down the hall and I'm thinking, we've got a great chance at this guy. But there wasn't sales. It was the school that I was representing and what we needed at the time. And I think a player can always tell if a coach really needs you, you know, and, and I think that's big in recruiting. They say that, you know, coach, I train kids kind of on the side. I have for years, you know, young football athletes, high school kids. And that's the, sometimes the best piece of advice you can give these young men is like, go where you're wanted. Right. Isn't that what we're saying? Go where you're wanted. Not where um, you're sold. Not where you're sold. Go where you're wanted. I think the other thing, Mike, and and you were a great example of that. Go where you fit. Go where you can tell that the coaching style is what you want. You know, I mean, if you if you're afraid to have a coach tell you that's not good enough, and if you keep doing that, you won't play. Then don't go there. Mm -hmm. you, you gotta you gotta be the kind of young man that i mean you came from a great program you came from where coaching was hard where you weren't i mean you you didn't come from a, a high school program where what you did was okay no matter what it was sure and that's the same way that i think i tried to instill that that's the way it's going to be when we're at notre dame and that was good for you and other kids they don't want to hear that interesting so I'm, what I'm kind of hearing you say is it's going to take time for Coach Freeman. And is at that time, does that mean he's going to have to really maybe hone his pitch? But we don't want to be a salesperson. It's like creating that perfect pitch, maybe finding the right type of kids while still being your authentic self as a, as a recruiter, as a staff. Is that what we're saying? No, I think what we're saying, Mike, more than anything, is it's going to take time for him to keep getting the kind of players that he wants and the kind of players that will win championships. And as he does that, the way he coaches and the way his staff coaches, that all works together. You get the players, you coach the players, and then you win ball games. And do you do you need the five star to win a championship coach. And then we're talking modern day. And I mean, gosh, did you get out of coaching at the right time? <laughs> you, know, you skipped over all this NIL stuff, but do you need a five star? No, no. My, so, some of the best players, were you a five star? I was damn near close. I, I know. Mean, I, you yeah, I was up there. Four star. You were a four star and you were the highest ranked guy. No, uh, Justin Tuck was a three star. Uh, I, I could name I could name guys the best players. The best players were three and four stars that wanted to show everybody who they really were. And this five star thing, yeah, that's great. That's all great for points, and that's all great for at the end of the year who had the best recruiting class. Well, the bottom line, the best recruiting class doesn't go to the bowl games. The best football team goes to the bowl games. Yeah, so, sure. You know, you know, now you got to be careful because there's some pretty, pretty good guys out there that are evaluating. And if you have a whole team of three stars and two stars, now you're not going to do real well, you know, mm -hmm. no matter what, you know, but five stars, I don't know. I mean, what's, what's the difference between a five star and a four star? I don't know if there's anything, you know, I've always, yeah, I've always looked at it. To me, through my lens, coach, I think a five star is almost like a ready made NFL player. Like, if I was rated higher than a Courtney Watson, you know, Courtney played running back and ended up being a Buckus finalist. But, like, you know, you've got your 20 pounds heavier, you're an inch taller, you're just more ready physically. That's how I've always looked at the how you delineate between a four and a five star is just maybe they're a half inch taller, again, 20 pounds heavier. That's right. how I've always seen it. Right, and maybe they went to a lot more camps sure. and a chance to be rated it, it compared to the guy that's in the middle of the backwoods somewhere that all he does is play football. Yeah, yeah, this is true. This is true. And then those are the guys that, you know, sometimes wind up at these, yeah, they're somewhat unheralded coming out of high school, like some of these Bama recruits, and then three years later, they're first-round picks. That's right. You that's aren't. right. That's right. So, you know, D-line was your specialty, Coach you know, this is me kind of becoming 
I've become a lot more invested in Notre Dame football now that I do this podcast, right? I mean, it wasn't necessarily the case a decade ago. Modern day football, all the D-line talent that you've accumulated and trained and coached, even into the NFL, how important is it to have like a 300-pound plus interior guy nowadays? Can you win a championship without – I mean, Notre Dame struggles to get those guys. Do you need that nowadays? Everybody stumbles to get those guys. Uh, I mean, the thing here's what here's the here's what happens when you're a high school football player. If you're a really good athlete on that team, you aren't playing nose tackle or three technique. You're playing defensive end, hmm. and that's where you want to play. I mean, I remember I remember a kid I had at Michigan by the name of Chris Wormley. And uh, Chris Wormley was a tremendous young man that was a giant. He was huge. He was from Toledo. And, uh, I mean, he played defensive end. And you could see he was not going to be a defensive end. But it took him maybe a year or two to, to decide that, okay, I'm going to play inside. Well, he's in his third or fourth year now starting for the Steelers. Sure. You know? uh, but – Kids in high school, they don't want to hear three technique or one technique. They don't want to hear playing defensive tackle. So when you find a young man like this guy that just came out from St. Ignatius, I mean, he's got the twitch and the explosiveness probably to be a six technique defensive end, but he is so good inside and he likes playing it. That's what he's played. So you got a guy that you don't have to recruit on your team to move inside. You got know, it. already going to play there, and he's already big, and he's already strong, and he has the outside quickness that you want inside. Huh. So you got the big picture right there. Got it. When you guys, uh, this is something I, and I frankly, I don't know the answer. So, like you're talking about recruiting a Mike Goolsby in Joliet, Illinois yet you're going down to Kellyton, Alabama to recruit Justin Tuck. So how does a staff or like staffs that you've been on, could you give us an example of how you guys break down who recruits what area, what position, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, usually usually it starts out where, um, where you're familiar with. And I was a Midwest guy. Sure. Uh, up in Wisconsin, uh, I had coached at Northwestern. I had coached at Michigan. I'd been in the Midwest. Okay, that was the first thing. So they would say, well, "You probably should. This guy should be Midwest." Okay. Then they go by where you've been before and where did you recruit before. Well, I had been at Texas A and M for three years, and I recruited Texas, so I was familiar with that. And anytime a coach is familiar with a high school area it's a positive because when you go into that high school you don't have to you don't have to spend the day trying to get the guy to know you and you know him you i used to know i used to know what high school i was going to go to whether they had a player or not just because i trusted the coach there and he could tell me if there was a good player somewhere and i would be able to then i could go from there to there but you know, I think that's the that's the first thing. The next thing is, like for me, I was coordinator, so the coordinator always has to go after the top kids on defense. Okay. If you're a defensive coordinator, you're you're definitely usually it's going to be the guy who has the area. Then it's going to be the defensive coordinator, and then the head coach has got to finish it off and 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 get the job done finally at the very end. So that's the way. That's the way. Is that written in stone, Coach, that like the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator is kind of the closer, and then the I guess the head coach is kind of like the icing on top of the Sunday? I mean, is that a hard and fast rule on college football staffs? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's really how it usually is. You know, uh, I'll give you a great example of it. Uh, you might remember the name. Uh, I'm sure you do. I'm, I'm kidding you when I say this. When I was at Florida, I recruited Tim Tebow. And uh, Tim Tebow was phenomenal. I mean, you know, he's just like the guy you would die to recruit. His family uh, were Christians. It was unbelievable. It was a tremendous thing. And I recruited him so hard. And he was homeschooled. Well, the offensive coordinator 
at the time, you know, was kind of leaning towards someone else. And I'm going, oh, we can't do this. Well, finally, I had to get with the head coach and, and kind of convince him that we need to take this guy over. I mean, get rid of me. Get rid of me now. You better get jump in full speed on this guy. Well, Urban did a phenomenal job. And Urban then then he be, that became his own his recruit when I had said that to him. So that that's how it works. You have an area that you recruit. And then, you know, the one thing that is important, I think, too, it's the same in everything in coaching and recruiting. Your ego's got to get out of the way. Too many young coaches, in my opinion, or too many coaches that, um, you know, maybe don't have great experience. They think they get paid by the number of recruits you get. And that isn't it, it, it. Recruiting is part of coaching. Your job is to coach in the fall and your job is to recruit and the year round. And your job is to bring in players that can help you win, because when you're gone, nobody really cares who recruited the guy. Or when he doesn't make that tackle on third and three, they're not going to go look it up. Say, I wonder who recruited that guy sure. at the team that you're on. So recruit players that can win. So you said coaches got to throw their ego out. Dig into that. So are you saying that they get their feelings hurt because a kid isn't necessarily doing backflips to sign with them, like to stick it out through the process versus going and finding another kid that's easier to sign. What do you mean by that? That's what I mean. I mean, okay. sometimes, sometimes, and this is just being human, you know, like, let's just say I'm recruiting a Cincinnati and I'm in Cincinnati and I find a defensive lineman that if I were to judge him, he's okay. He could be a good player, but I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Uh, and I think I can get him. All right. Well, another member on my staff on the staff is recruiting in Minnesota and he finds a kid that is uh, is really good, really, really good. And you look at the film of my kid and his kid. And the next thing you decide is what are the real chances of getting him? Now, let's be honest with each other. Can you get this kid from Minnesota? Because I know I can get this kid from Cincinnati. Well, you got to be honest with yourself. You're never 100% right. But if the guy in Minnesota says, yes, I can get this guy. Well, then you only got one signee that year on defensive line. You got to all say, let's go with the Minnesota guy then. Well, some programs, the guy will say, no, I want my guy. Why? Okay. Because recruiting him. No, that's not why you should be recruiting, you know. And it's, those are the kind of things you got to make sure you don't have in a program. Interesting. And then that's where, so you could have two coaches kind of standing on the table in a staff meeting. You do. In fact, it turns into a pissing contest, right? I mean, well, that's what your meetings are. That's what your meet. I mean, in recruiting, you have meetings when a kid comes in for his visit. For example, you got 12 kids coming in for a visit. You talk about every one of them and you talk, I mean, you as a recruiter get up and say, I love this kid. I believe he can win a championship for us. And then you might have another guy that has looked at it and said, I, I don't, I don't know if he's that good, you know? And so that's where the, you got to have a, a staff of people that all they care about is winning. And then you have a head coach who sees the whole picture also. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. I love that. That piece about the coordinator is kind of the lead guy. Yeah. But it's, I still don't you – know, I asked you earlier about the geography. How do you break up territories? And it's like – I know Greg Madison, back in the day, you're all over the place. You're recruiting Florida. You're recruiting Texas. You're recruiting Alabama. It's just – it's interesting. Another thing that you touched on, Coach, is like you coach in the fall. You recruit in the off season. Is that how you see modern-day college coaching? To me, it seems like – it's more so like 80% of the job at these high end in Ohio state a Notre Dame, a Michigan, a Florida type. It seems like 80% of the job to me is recruiting anymore. It's like, if you right. don't get the kid, it's your, developing. It's your round. And, and really it's your round. And you have to have in the back of your mind that I better do a great job recruiting this guy because I could be the best coach in the world. And it ain't going to matter. He's not going to be good enough. So you want to recruit guys that you know you can develop into being winning great 
football players. And that's mm -hmm. what you, why you recruit, but you have to recruit year round. I mean, these coaches, you're, you're getting ready all day for practice. You're, you're looking at scouting report. You're watching the team you're playing. You're working from six in the morning until practice starts at two 30. When practice is over, you're looking at the practice film. When the practice film is, you might take a break during that time to go make three recruiting calls. Cause you got to call the kid during the week. And if you don't get a hold of him, then you're in trouble. So you do that. And then you start all over and it goes again, you start all over. Like, like I was thinking, the place we live here is in right by South Bend. It's yep. Edwardsburg. It's uh, on a lake. Well, the reason we got this place was because our son and the grandkids all live here. But we had one month a year, well, really not even a month, three weeks a year off. So that in July, we needed a place to come. So we left when we were in Ann Arbor and came here and we had a place on the lake right here. And I'll never forget getting up in the morning and sitting out on a balcony overlooking the lake, dialing for hours, calling recruits, thinking this is vacation. Yeah. But that's really what you had to do. And it might not have been a long conversation, but it was you saying, Hey, Hey Mike, how's everything going at Joliet? Hey, I'm thinking about you. We're on vacation. Uh, you know, I will, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do that, you know, and 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 so I mean it. That's what it did, you know. What a wild, what a wild experience. Because again, I go back. We are getting old, Coach, but it's like when you were recruiting me. This is 1998. I didn't get a cell phone until my junior year of college. So you're calling the house phone, and then yeah. nowadays you fast forward. You know, kids or coaches are having to text these kids. Could you imagine you at you know 70 plus years old texting these 16 year olds? Is this yeah. like it's yeah. wild how technology's changed recruiting. And, and really, and and honestly, um, like I could still do it now. I I, I wouldn't have any problem. But the thing about it is, you might be in seventeen years old at Joliet Catholic, and me being seventy three years old walking in recruiting you. Now we may just hit it off, and you might say, "Hey, this guy." But in the back of your mind, you're saying, "How long is he going to coach?" You know, I'm not going to so I really believe it's a young man's game. You know, the only other thing that people don't realize, and I think this is really, really important in recruiting. It truly is a family deal. Everybody that I ever recruited, I'm, I'm telling you, everybody that I ever recruited would say, yeah, Coach Madison did a good job recruiting me, but his wife's the one that got me. And. It, it it's it they have to know i mean i remember recruiting weekends and would be there recruiting harder than any other person because she knew herself that hey if we have winning teams it's going to be a lot more fun being married to this guy sure. and, uh, i don't know if you remember like uh, the little thing i mean you remember every time you got a sack or you got a I was talking about that i was talking about it yesterday I was talking right. about this yesterday yeah well i got a text from a young man i won't give you his name but he's plays starts for the denver broncos that uh, <laughs> that it said coach how's your summer going hey tell mrs madison i'd like some of those cookies again <laughs> and i texted sure. back and i said you haven't gotten a sack lately yeah. <laughs> yeah it was sack or turnover i remember right i think that's but, what it worked yeah no that's that's a great point that i think that goes back to like the the authenticity piece you know being your your true self as a, as a coach, as a recruiter versus trying to be a, I guess, a, a salesman, you know? Yeah. And, and, and honest to God on staffs, all staffs are, are made up of different people. And I've been so fortunate to have worked at so many great programs that they had great staffs, but I used to always, and my wife would tell them the young guys that were coaching, would come in and there'd be a recruiting weekend and you might see some wives talking in a corner and my wife would go over and say, you got to talk to these players. You've got to talk to these parents. I mean, it's a thing that, that that's not sales. That's letting them know that everybody is important in this hmm. program, you know, and that's, that's just something I don't think that you people do a lot any much anymore. Well, yeah. And your wife, 
shout out to Ann for getting this computer, helping us getting this computer <laughs> set up today. <laughs> but, uh, you know, she was talking about that. She was talking about, you know, your career, your job. And she was like, well, it wasn't a job. She's like, it was our life. Yeah. That's and your right. career. And you coach for 40 years, coach. Is that right? 50 years. Unbelievable. Because I know Lisa, your daughter, who played softball at Notre Dame, for those that don't know, she reached out to me, you know, to film a little something for, I guess they did a retirement video montage for you. So I thought that was cool that she thought to reach out to me. But like, if you look back at your 50 year career in coaching, what are you most proud of? What do you hang your hat on? Well, you mentioned before you said you mentioned Lisa, and you were there. I, I mean, I get teased all the time. I'll never forget when she was playing softball there. Remember our practice field was right there next to the softball field, and I'll never forget she would be batting, and they would say number twenty-five, Lisa Madison, and the guys. <laughs> I, I just I can still remember the defensive guys would finally say to me. Hey, I'd be doing drills. They'd say, coach, just go over and watch her hit and come back, you know, teasing me, you know, like that. Cause you could see you weren't, weren't paying attention, but that was a great experience that way too, to have her right there. But, uh, um, uh, you know, what was your last question? It was, it was looking back yeah. 50 years in the game. What are you most proud of? What do you hang your hat on as a, because, I mean, I could think about – I was thinking about – I could hardly sleep last night, truly, because I was excited for this. And I think – and I'll, I'll, buy, I'll buy you some time to answer. But I think about, like, what made Coach Madison such a good recruiter and, like, you know, why did I believe you? Why did my parents believe you? Like, you had my mom wrapped around your finger. It was unbelievable. She's going to watch this back, and, and she's going to uh, agree. But it's said. like, I think that your players didn't want to disappoint you yeah. You know, I think you had that kind of gray hair factor, like, yeah, I, I think, think that was a very real thing. I, I think, I think, Mike, one of the biggest things is I think my goal was always with you, with every kid I recruited, my goal was always to make sure that what I told him and what I promised him he would get at the school I was recruiting for, that I would do everything I could possibly do to make sure that came through. Hmm. And I think the other thing, and it's probably how I was brought up, I was always very, very honest. In other words, if a guy didn't play good, I'm gonna let him know that's not good. And you can't do that. If he played great, I'm gonna hug him like he's my son. And uh, I just think, um, you know, like you said it earlier, I think I, I I had so much invested in the players I recruited that my whole goal was for them to be successful. And not for me, I could care less if anybody knew that he was my recruit or he was my player. I wanted to make sure that he had a chance to do whatever he wanted to do and why he came to that school. Yeah. Yeah, I still believe you. Last thing. You know, I was a part of the, fortunate enough to be a part of that 2002 defense at Notre Dame, you know, Coach Willingham's first year. Yep. And I, people still talk about that defense. And I know, hell, I mean, you coach Ray Lewis. Yeah. I mean, you've been a part of some special defenses, some special, been around some special players. But I do want to give you a little bit of credit. And as I kind of wind down this interview, Coach, I know you got to get on the road. But like, you brought to that defense, to that locker room, that mentality of getting to the ball, hustle, effort, no loafs, et cetera. Has that always been a part of your DNA as a coach? 100%. Uh, I think uh, if anybody ever would, like coaches, if they ever would say to me or say, uh, Greg Madison, uh, what did, was he a pass rush guy? Was he a run stopping guy? They would all say, no, he was a pursuit, play hard football coach. And when I spoke at clinics or like, like, for example, like with, with you guys, that team, that was my first year to be able to do that with the backers, with the do that with you guys is, is because, I mean, just for some reason we couldn't do it, but anyhow, um, it was to run to the football and 
if if you and we remember we broke it down. We yeah. had it down where there were there were five or four things that would say whether it was a loaf or not. One, if Mike Goolsby got beat, I would say to you, I'd say, Mike, what's your time in a forty? You would tell me, and I would go, okay, then if this guy beats you to the football, then you're loafing because mm-hmm. your time is faster than his time. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing would be if a guy was on the ground and he didn't get up off the ground fast enough, that was a loaf. Yep. If, uh, you know, I mean, it, and, and, and we, you always all bought into that. And that was part of coaching buy into it. We practiced it starting out every practice. You remember that we came yeah. out pursuit drill boys. Here we go. Bang. It took 20 seconds or a minute. We were done. We went right into individual. Sure. And, uh, I, I, that's what that's. And, and, I've had, like, you want to say a compliment, probably the greatest compliment that I've ever, or people have said to me that is, I watch your players and they play so hard. To me, that's everything. That means I got, that as a coach, you coach the young man to play what he's supposed to play. Sure. And that's what you guys did. And that's what made that defense special. Yeah, yeah. I think it's amazing because it goes back to, again, like, you didn't want to disappoint coach yeah. and then you don't want to, that trickles down to your teammates. You don't want to disappoint your teammates. It's just a beautiful part of defensive football that I think, honestly, coach, it gets overlooked. Yes. Everybody wants to talk about scheme. Everybody wants to talk about personnel. It's like, get to the damn ball. And good no, things happen. You, you are right. See, you're old school. See, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Like I'll sit there. Like uh, I get a chance to go talk at clinics and the people invite me in to talk and all that. And they always want to talk about scheme and technique and stuff like that. And I'll go, do you do pursuit drill? Yeah. Now they're supposed to run the ball. They don't run to the ball. Let's look at this film. And I put it on there and they, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. If they ever, if they ever built a statue of coach Madison, it'd be because <laughs> you were a basics guy. It was like, you had the ball on the stick working on get off. I mean, it wasn't, it's not rocket science. That's right. You know, and that was 2002. That was 2002. You could have the exact same picture playing for the national championship against Alabama in 2020. Sure. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, coach, I appreciate it. I know you got a road trip. You're headed off to uh, tell Mickey I said hello. I will for sure. Please do. I love you both. And yeah. I consider myself very fortunate to have crossed paths with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. All right, Coach. We'll see you. Yeah, buddy. Take care. Yep, yeah, old singer just uh, talking with the mic off. That's uh, that's my bad. But yeah, uh, for uh, for folks still watching, listening. Really appreciate you. That was the interview with uh, Mike Goolsby talking to Greg Madison, the coach who got him to South Bend. Um, so, uh, yeah, please do hit that thumbs up if you're watching here on YouTube. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please leave us a kind review. And for everyone, please head to blueandgold.com, of course, for all Notre Dame football coverage. Uh, Jason, I do agree. I think that was an awesome interview. Some really good stuff. And, uh, as always, let us know in the comments of the YouTube videos and on the blueandgold.com message board who you want Goolsby to bring on the show next. Um, you know, anyone, especially from his playing days, but really we're always open to anyone on um, that we believe we can get um, on the show. So, uh, yeah, we'll have a uh, show with myself and Tim Hyde Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time. So definitely tune into that. And I believe the recruiting show will be back Friday as well. So a busy week on our blue and gold YouTube channel, folks. I'm Mike Singer. Really appreciate you guys tuning into the Mike Goolsby show. Again, head over to blueandgold.com for all of your uh, Notre Dame coverage. Uh, Yes. Jason Smith, Shane Walton has been on. Um, That was someone who I, I really wanted to get, um, on our, our YouTube channel and uh, uh, Shane, uh, I want to say maybe March. It was after Tyler Buckner news, maybe a couple weeks after that. So sometime March, February, whatever that was. Um, so yeah, uh, you can rewind or, or you know scroll through the archives and find that interview, Jason. Um, but yeah, really do appreciate you folks for tuning in. And as always, we will catch you next time, which I hope is Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Myself and Zimbai. Appreciate you guys. And uh, we'll catch you next time.